Recently, there was a 1150% increase in people on Google searching for, does iodine help in a nuclear war? And you know, those K1 potassium iodide pills are just flying off the shelf. And in many places, they're completely out of stock. And if they do have them, the prices are greatly inflated. And I think there is a lot of misconception about what K1 potassium iodide can do for you and your family. And I want to stress that it is not a magic anti-radiation drug. Let me repeat that. It is not an anti-radiation drug. It will only protect you from one type of cancer that you might develop many years in the future from radiation exposure. So do I maintain that you need K1 potassium iodide for your preps? You know, not really. And I want to explain why. So I'm going to combine some footage from a video I made four plus years ago on K1 potassium iodide with current research. I think you will be surprised. Here's the intro from that video. Lately, the news has been pretty scary. We have North Korea saying that they are going to nuke Guam sometime next week. We have the U.S. saying, we'll nuke you back, basically, or we'll do one better, we'll do a preemptive strike. So, you know, I grew up in the Cold War, so it was always out there, but this is kind of scary, it really is. And it makes me think, I wanna make sure I have all my preps in order. So one of the things I think many, many preppers have is this Iostat, right? These are potassium iodide pills, um, also known as K1, which is the chemical element. And I thought today I'd talk a little bit about what are these, what can they do for you, who should take them, and who should take them. I urge you to watch that video in entirety, and I have a link in the corner, and the URL down below. Okay, little bit of change in four years. The threat isn't necessarily coming from North Korea now, it's coming from Russia. But I wanted to go over this because there's a lot of talk about K1 potassium iodide and I want you to know it is not a miracle anti-radiation drug. And I'm gonna tell you why. But before I do that, I'm gonna repeat the disclaimer I had in that original video. Now, I first have to give, of course, a disclaimer. Believe it or not, I am not a nuclear physicist, nor am I a medical doctor, and nor do I play one on YouTube. So, this is just research that I've done. As always, do your own research and come up with materials you trust from sources you trust. Now for a little background. You know, for the bombing in 1945 of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, almost, I believe, 200,000 people died right then or not long after from the effects of the radiation. Let me read you a quote on that. The estimates are rough because, quote, there were no bodies left to count near the hypercenter. The heat and energy literally vaporized the closest persons. And many bodies were swept out to sea with the tides after dying burn victims sought relief in Hiroshima's numerous rivers. I mean, that's such a horrific picture. But because of these two events, we were able to do longitudinal studies and see what the results are of radiation long-term on the human body. Now, exposure to radiation, while well, if you're at the upper center, we already learned what happened, and if you're still close, 
you can have um, terrible skin burns and a little further away you can get acute radiation syndrome that's you know what we used to call radiation sickness well here's a clip what i originally said in that video now i need to say there's many many things that can happen from a nuclear event just taking this pill is not going to prevent you. you know you're not going to live through a nuclear event if you're too close of course you'll just blow up right uh, or uh, you look at it and it burns your retina so you are blind or um, again it depends on your proximity but basically your skin almost melts off or you have terrible terrible burns and blisters or a couple weeks down the road your basically your innards start going to mush because of radiation exposure so if you live through such a blast there are going to be long-term health effects such as cancer and cardiovascular disease for some of the people near the blast. Now, not surprisingly, studies show that incidents raise for cancer for those that are closer to the epicenter. The further away, the incident goes down. Now they found out that the relative risk increased how close you were to the detonation site, age, Younger people faced a greater lifetime risk because their cells are still changing and building, so they're affected more. And the person's sex. There was a greater risk for women as compared to men, and one of the reasons was breast cancer. So remarkably, most of the survivors did not develop cancer. Only about 10% did. Now, for those, though, that were closer to the epicenter, they received, those that received radiation dosages, I think they call it one gray, which was a thousand times higher than the acceptable limit. They had about a 44% cancer rate eventually. But overall, it only reduced lifespan by approximately 1.3 years. You know, I would have thought it would have been much, much higher. The number one cancer that these survivors suffered was leukemia. It started to appear about two years after the event and it peaked about four to six years later and not surprisingly children was where the highest representation was for the leukemia. Now, K1 can help with solid cancer. However, only one kind, and that is thyroid cancer. So what do these pills do? Well, your thyroid gland absorbs, like I said, iodine. Now, it doesn't know the difference between radioactive iodine being released by a nuclear accident or stable iodine. And it only has so much capacity. So kind of think of your thyroid gland as a gas tank. And what you want to do is fill it up with a stable potassium iodide, as opposed to having it being full of the radioactive iodide. So when you take these is important, how often you take them is important, and how close you are to a nuclear accident, of course. So the most thorough study regarding the incidence of solid cancer, you know, not leukemia, was done in 2003. And the study estimated that the attributable rate of radiation exposure to solid cancer was significantly lower than leukemia, only about 10%. Again, the data correlates the general rule that even if someone is exposed to a barely survivable whole body radiation dose, the solid cancer risk will not be more than five times greater than the risk of an unexposed individual. Pretty interesting. Now we've already said the highest risk for survivors for cancer was leukemia. It's followed by cancer of the stomach, the lung, liver, and breast. And there was also heightened risk of heart failure, stroke, asthma, bronchitis, and gastrointestinal conditions. Now, what these studies have shown that, yes, exposure increased the incidence of 
cancer with the survivors. However, it wasn't like immediately you'd get cancer. It was you would get cancer when the normal population would generally get cancer in their lifespan. So the lifespan of survivors was only reduced by a few months compared to those not exposed to radiation. And you hear a lot to the contrary, but there's been no health effects of any sort have been detected detected in children of the survivors, so it wasn't passed on their genes to survivors. So let's talk about K1 potassium iodide again. It only treats one of those types of cancer, thyroid. Not all the others, and thyroid cancer is not the most frequent that happens from radiation exposure. For Hiroshima survivors, it took four to 15 years to develop thyroid cancer. And again, it was more prevalent in the young. And let's talk about who should take the K1 potassium iodide pills. Now let's talk about who should take these pills. Well, if you have a limited supply, you might have to ration them. So if you have a pregnant woman, you give her one pill first because the fetus developing is at the most susceptible to thyroid damage. You also want to give it to infants and very young children, because again, their thyroid is still developing. It's much more susceptible. And your next would be your teenagers. And then if you have enough, your 18 to 40 year olds. Now, Past the age of 40, you have less likely chance of developing thyroid cancer from radiation exposure. And if you're over 60, you have a lot less likely chance. Now, part of that depends, of course, on how close you are and how much you are exposed. But you want to look at that if you only have maybe one of these and you're waiting for the government to give you more, then decide who you give your pills to by their age. So let's summarize what we've learned here. K1 potassium iodide only prevents one type of cancer, that is thyroid cancer. And we have to remember that thyroid cancer is highly treatable. It's one of the most treatable cancers there are. There's a 98% survival rate to the five-year mark. That is really good for cancer. So, the other reason is thyroid cancer is usually slow to develop the tumors, and that's what makes it easier to catch and easier to treat. K1 potassium iodide works best if taking before the event happens. So it gets to your thyroid first, blocks it up for any of the dangerous stuff coming in, right? And you might not have that kind of notice to be able to take those pills in time. It is also a preventive treatment that should be reserved for mainly the young. You know, those 40 and under, but especially the very young, because they are the ones that need it the most. You know, at my age, 67, well, won't be 67 till June, let's not hurry it up, but anyway, I gave my pills to my kids because I don't need them. I couldn't even take them anyway because I have uh, Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, so wouldn't work for me. So depending on your age, this isn't really something you need to have in your preps. You also must look at what is the cost of this prep? How much benefit are you going to get out of it? Should you spend that money instead on bottled water? As for instance, if there was a radioactive type event, you know, as long as your food is in packages and cans, it's safe. But your water supply may not be. So, water in your plastic bottle or your glass bottle is safe. So maybe it's more important to put your money into that because you're gonna need that maybe right away. 
And as we've discussed this thing about the K1 potassium iodide, it's protecting you from something that might never happen to you or only happen 5, 10, 15 years down the road. And when it does, it's probably curable. So that's what I'm getting at. Don't panic because you can't find K1 potassium iodide. It really has limited use. I can't stress enough. Think about your other preps. It's much, much more important. And you also have to think, what is the chance that it will really happen? I don't know. I sure hope it's a small chance, but that's something, a calculation you have to make yourself. So if you already have it in your preps, great, but reserve it for the young people. If you don't have it, don't panic. As you can see, it's not that miracle anti-radiation supplement or drug that everybody seems to talk about. It has a very limited purpose. I hope you found this helpful and I hope you are continuing to prep. It's so, so important, not just now, always be prepared. So you never have to say, oh, if only I would have, right?